So Stefan will, will talk on Silberg sieve. And uh, I will talk on large sieve. So my plan is as follows. So first we do some introduction. So this will be the philosophy of large sieve. Second will be the analytic form. Form of large sieve. Third will be the arithmetic form. Of the large sieve. And fourth will be some applications to number theory. And this will include uh, something called restriction theorem. For primes, so this will be needed later in the course by Surya Ramana and uh, Gyan Prakash. So today I will only do the introduction and maybe a little bit of analytic large sieve. <clears throat> so let's start with uh, some linear algebra. So, so let be a bilinear form, so Cm cross Cn to C. So it's a map which is linear in both variables, both uh, x and y. Then such a map can be written in terms of a matrix, just like a linear map can be given by a matrix. So any then there exists a matrix, capital B, say B of M comma N. So this is the Mth row and Nth column, such that uh, B of X comma Y, so X is coming from C to the M and this is coming from C to the N and this should be given by X transpose B Y, I hope uh, the orders are all correct. Yeah, so the number of columns is N, so this is fine. Uh, where uh, if you expand it, then it becomes a double sum, m and n, uh, b of m n, x m y n. So here, uh, x is the vector. So for me, all the vectors are column vectors. So x one, x two, up to x m, and y is y one, y two, up to y n. And then, oh, I am prohibited to go there. So we want, so suppose we want a bound of the form
V X Y squared <coughs> less than delta norm X square norm Y square. And this should hold for every X and Y, for all X and Y. And uh, delta should not depend on X and Y. So delta can depend only on the form, nothing else. Okay, so in fact, one can easily get such a bound by, let's see, so by Cauchy's inequality. So, so for example, one can take Okay, uh, what shall we get? Uh, so let's uh, see what Cauchy's inequality gives us. So, so bxy uh, square is sum over n, sum over n, b of mn, xmyn. So first, let's do Cauchy on the m variable. So you get sum over m, xm square, and uh, so, uh, sum over m, uh, let's call it bm square, square, B sub M is sum over N, B of N, Y N. Okay. So now uh, for this sum, I can again apply Cauchy's inequality. So B M square is less than or equal to summation Y N square and uh, summation B M N square. So if you plug this bound in, I get B of XY squared is less than or equal to uh, delta times norm X squared, norm Y squared. So this norm is the usual L2 norm, right? So sum of XM squared is norm X squared, where delta is is sum over m, sum over n, b m n. So if uh, for many examples, this b m n will be of size one. So suppose these are bounded by one, then delta will be bounded by uh, m times n. And this we call the trivial bound. So we call this because we haven't used any property of the matrix. We just used Cauchy's inequality. And this assumption is, uh, it's a normalization. It's not a serious assumption. So this is the trivial bound. And in large C, what happens is for some interesting matrices which come from number theory, we want to obtain non-trivial bound. or interesting matrices. Okay, and here we can prove a general proposition. It's very easy, some abstract proposition that 
uh, one may take delta to be norm of B, the matrix norm of B. So where norm of B is defined by the usual definition, you apply uh, B to some vector, take its norm, and divide by the norm of the vector, and take the supremum over X. The usual operator norm of the matrix. And uh, one shows that, I think the largest eigenvalue will also give the same thing. And why is this proposition true? This is clear from, from this part. So we, we want a bound like this. So this will give you norm x square. This, and now I have this thing. But uh, you see, uh, this vector of BM, that's precisely the, uh, okay, so how to say this? So, see the, uh, the proof. So you, you look at uh, this vector BM1, BM2, whatever, uh, I don't remember, so B1, B2, let's say, to Bm. What is this vector? This is nothing but B times um, the vector, you know, y1, y2, yn, right? That's, that's my Bm. So what we are doing here, you know, sum of this Bm square, that's just the norm of uh, By. So hence, this is nothing but norm of By square. And that, by definition, is bounded by uh, norm B times norm Y square. Right? Because this is the supremum. And therefore, this proposition follows that uh, we can take delta to be norm B. But the problem is, if you are given a matrix, you don't know how to compute this norm. So we will, uh, so this is an abstract theorem, this is a correct statement, but it's not very useful. So we will obtain some useful bounds uh, when this matrix comes from number theory. So the question is, uh, yeah. so where are we? Yeah, so uh, we cannot go there, so let's go back. So we saw that we can take delta to be m times n, but which is not a very good bound, it's too large. And we have an abstract bound which is not useful. Uh, and we want to make delta smaller. The question is how small can we get? What is the best that we can expect? And so we will obtain some lower bound of this, of delta, that we cannot expect delta to be too small. No, that, this is a normalization that we can assume. I mean, if it is not, we can always uh, Re rename the variable and we assume that. So everything will be measured subject to some normalization. So this is my normalization. So the question is, uh, okay, so for that, we start with, again, so my bxy is sum over m, sum over n, uh, x, what was this? Uh, no, so we, we have already obtained that this is smaller than norm of 
x squared, and then <laughs> sum over uh, this thing, right? Uh, so this is sum over m, and this is sum over n, and this is b m n y n. So let's forget this because uh, this is not contributing. So let's look at the sum over m. Sum over n, sum over n. This, if you expand, open the square, the sum over m, and then sum over n1, sum over n2. B, B, uh, m n1, b m n2 bar because it's absolute value square and I have y n1, y n2 bar. And uh, so if you are curious the kind of matrix we will have in number theory, uh, this B will be, for example, a matrix coming from chi of, so for example, BMN can be chi M of N. So chi, chi M are varying, so we have a set of characters, and N is going from 1 to N, so these kind of examples. So anyway, so we, we were here. And so, uh, so you see, the point is uh, what. So what we expect is that. So first of all, I can uh, interchange the sum. And then sum over m b m n1, b, m, n2, bar, and then since it's coming, it is something like a character, we expect cancellations here. So earlier when we were doing, getting the trivial bound, we were just saying these are all ones, but actually there will be cancellations, which we want to exploit. But if n1 equals n2, there is no cancellation. And that is the diagonal, so this is Diagonal plus of diagonal. So diagonal means n1 equals n2. Here n1 is not equal to n2. So in this of diagonal part, we expect cancellation. And in the diagonal, we expect no cancellation. But in the diagonal, that is uh, n1 equals n2, we expect, I mean, there cannot be any cancellation because everything is positive. So there is no cancellation. So, this part we cannot do anything. And how much, how large is this part? So this is, uh, sum over n, absolute value of y n square, and sum over m, b m comma n square. And whatever delta I am trying to get, I should, know that I cannot get better than this. See, this is going to be, this is just norm y square. And then this is my m, uh, wait, what happened? Uh, no, this depends on n, so that we cannot write. 
Some should aim and end, right? Uh, Summation aim and end, right, right. Yeah, so this is norm y square and then, uh, no, no, that's not true. What is happening? What is the diagonal? N on, so this is sum over n. Yeah, that, that is fine. There is no sum over n here. And, uh, okay, so that's fine and, uh, So if we, uh, if we bound, we assume B and N are always bounded by one, then diagonal will be smaller than M times norm Y square, right? This will be at most M. So this diagonal, so this delta has to be at least as large as the diagonal. So hence, we cannot expect delta to be smaller than M. Delta has to be as large as M. Because this delta can be exactly M. If all the BMN are one, or I have absolute value one. So delta, we were asking how small should we expect? We cannot expect it to be smaller than M. And we shall see that delta cannot be smaller than N also, where N is the length of the sum. And to do that, we need something called duality principle. So that's another abstract result. the duality, yeah. So, proposition. Suppose delta is such that sum over m, so <laughs> is less than or equal to delta times norm y square for all y in Cn. Okay, then or all x in Cm, the following holds. So it is the same thing, but the m and n will be interchanged. So n up to n, m up to m, and now I have bmn again, but now I have xm. delta times norm x square. Okay, is the statement clear? So if delta satisfies this for every y, then delta will also satisfy this where we interchange m and n. And essentially what it says is that, so remark, What it says is nothing but in a norm of the operator, uh, the matrix B is same as norm of the matrix B star, the dual, the dual operator. But let's prove it uh, without uh, going into that. So the proof is quite easy.
So let us call the LHS uh, left hand side some give some number. So let's say A. So let so I am proving it. So let A be the left hand side, which is uh, I mean left hand side of what needs to be proved. So uh, this one. So this is uh, sum over n, sum over m, b m n, x m. So you open the square. So here will be m one, m one and m two, b m one, n, x m. B n two n bar. Uh, this is m one. This is m two bar. So write it as sum over m one. So we have x m one and uh, what are we doing here? It's a bit tricky. So sum over n. And then uh, sum over m2, b m2 comma n, this is bar x m2 bar. That's it, right? Ah, no, there is some b m1 n. Okay, I'm just rearranging this thing. Okay, now call these things yn. So this is sum over m1, xm1, sum over n, uh, what is that? Yeah, so this is sum over n yn times b m one n, right? Where yn is sum over m2, but I can write m again, it doesn't matter, it's just an m. Right? Uh, this whole thing is yn, so this is yn times this. Now we apply Cauchy. By Cauchy, okay. So, absolute value a square, but this a is a. It comes from. It's a square, so it's positive already. So a square is less than or equal to norm x square. This is from sum of the squares, and then sum over m. Uh, sum over uh, n b m1 comma n times y n square. This is sum over m1. Okay, is that clear? I'm applying Cauchy, so this norm x square comes out and then sum over m and square of this, that's all. But this one is uh, exactly in this form. So I can apply my assumption. So this is now smaller than delta times norm y square. Right, but uh, what is norm y square? So y is the vector whose components are this. 
So this is uh, sum over n, sum over n, bmn, xm square. And does that look familiar? That's precisely my left hand side. So this is just uh, A. So we have proved, so let's uh, uh, so put it in parentheses. So this is less than or equal to delta A uh, norm X square. So therefore, I can cancel A, and I get uh, A is less than delta X square, which is what we wanted to prove, that this is left-hand side should be less than delta X square. Okay, is the proof clear? Okay, so this is a useful theorem that we will use many times, this duality. Okay, and next, uh, what do we want? Okay, so one corollary is that uh, so what the duality principle tells you is that uh, you know this problem and the other problem are same essentially. We get the same delta. And earlier we saw delta has to be at least as large as m. But by duality, I can rephrase the problem, and then we, sh we shall see that we need delta to be at least as large as n. So a corollary, we must have delta as large as n. So since n plays the role of m, In the dual, in the dual case. So hence, delta has to be larger than n. Delta has to be larger than m. So delta has to be larger than n plus m. So we were asking how small can we take delta? The answer is. We cannot expect it to be smaller than n plus m, where m and n are the the number of the you know the sizes of the two vectors. Huh? Yeah, but maximum and plus are in analytic number theory they are same <laughs> of the same size. <laughs> yeah. So and when we have a bound. Uh, with delta equal to m plus n or almost equal to m plus n, we say that it's a sharp large sieve inequality. So I haven't properly defined what is large sieve inequality. I'm going to do that now. Okay, so let's talk about large sieve inequality. So remember this statement of duality. I'll, I'll write another version of duality. Uh, Uh, a large sieve <laughs> so I will abbreviate it by LSI is an inequality of the form uh, 
sum over f in some family f, sum over, let's say, see, I want to write from m to m plus n to emphasize that what matters is the length of the vector, not the initial point. So it could have been 1 to n or m to n plus n for any of so You want to bound it. So you see, we are in the same situation. Earlier we wrote b of m comma n, but this role of m is now being played by f, small f. And our capital M will be same as the size of the script f, size of the family. This is script F. And we want a bound like this for any, so for any, uh, any sequence AN supported in the interval m to m plus n. So it is, uh, so after, okay, so it's gone, but uh, we earlier had a bilinear form and we applied Cauchy. After applying Cauchy, we got a sum and this sum is exactly like this. Okay, so uh, what is the duality principle in this, this setup? So duality implies uh, sum over f in f and <coughs> fn for all a implies, or in fact, by symmetric, these are equivalent, so I'm writing equivalent, sum over n sum over cf times fn, this is sum over f, so here this was sum over n. So you see n and f have been changed, uh, interchanged. This should also be less than delta for all, and this is, uh, you know, it's like c of f1, c of f2, up to C of FD. C to the power D. So where uh, D is the size of the family. So these things are indexed by the f's. So f is playing the role of m earlier. Okay. And uh, I make a remark which I said earlier that, uh, so, uh, smaller than, instead of m plus n, I will just now write uh, size of the family plus n. Uh, so, uh, yeah, okay. So this is the size of the family. And this is the length. Length of the, the sequence. Okay, and when I get such a delta, we say we have a sharp large inequality. Delta of, of the size up to a constant uh, size of the family plus length, we say, we call it a sharp 
large sieve inequality because it cannot be improved upon. It's the best possible. So let's see an example, I think, that will clarify things of a sharp large sieve inequality. So I call it theorem zero. character mod chi, uh, mod q root value a n m to m plus n chi n is bounded by so what is the size of the family here it's the number of Dirichlet character with modulus q and what is that number phi of q good and the length is n for all a. Okay, supported in, I mean, okay, it is written, so it's not necessary. So for any sequence a, I have this bound. So it is in fact true. So in this case, we have a sharp large sieve. And the proof is not difficult. Let's see proof. So as usual, you expand the square. Uh, so if you expand the square, you get n1, n2, a n1, a n2 bar, chi of n1, chi of n2 bar. And then uh, when you have a sum, we have to interchange. So this is same as uh, chi of n1 n2 bar, right? And as I was saying, we expect cancellation. And in fact, cancellations do take place because of orthogonality of characters. Okay? So since I'm summing over all characters, I will get zero unless n1 n2 bar is 1 mod q. So if it is 1 mod q, I'm just adding 1, so I'll get phi of q. Otherwise, I will get 0. So this is so I get phi of q times indicator function, n1 is congruent to n2 mod q. Okay. If this happens, I get phi of q, zero otherwise. Okay, and now I have to write it nicely. So this is phi of q, this comes out. Oh, another thing one should put, you see chi is zero unless n1 and n2 are co-prime with q. So you should actually put n1 and n2 is co-prime with q everywhere. Okay, so here n1 and n2 is co-prime, otherwise you will get zero. I mean, so phi q, so n1 and n2, n1, n2 co-prime with q, and n1 is congruent to n2 mod q. So you write it in a nice way. Uh, you look at the residue classes mod q, so a mod q. And you put a star to denote that these are co-prime residue classes. So this is a notation that this means uh, A uh, mod Q, where A and Q are co-prime. Okay, so and then I have, now you can write N1 congruent to A. A n1, 
and N2 congruent to A, what Q always, A N2 bar, right? I am just dividing this sum into, according to the residue classes. So both N1 and N2 have to be, uh, they are equal mod Q, so I am dividing them according to the residue classes, they fall in. Mod Q and then N1 and N2 are both A. So this is nothing but phi of Q, some star, A mod Q, and this is nothing but square of a n n congruent to A mod Q. Okay, is that clear? This is the same thing with, the, you know, this sometimes complex conjugate, it's the absolute value square. Okay, now you cannot do anything, so you apply Cauchy. Phi of Q, so this is one times this, A mod Q, one square, times A mod Q, A n square. This is just a number of, uh, no. uh, wait, no, 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 this is not correct, what am I doing? Phi of Q, uh, wait, it's like strange. Uh, did I make any mistake somewhere? No. Ah, yeah, yeah, so the Cauchy is happening here, right? This is one times this. So, uh, no, 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 the Cauchy is happening here. So you will get, uh, yeah, so A mod Q, so don't do anything in this sum. For this sum, you apply Cauchy. So you'll get sum over one square N congruent to A mod Q times sum over and going to A mod Q, A N square. Yeah. That's fine. But this sum, this is just, uh, you see this N is running from M to M plus N. So the length is N, and I'm counting number of N in an arithmetic progression. So that is box of N by Q, plus one at most. So this sum is N by Q plus one. This is less than phi q this whole sub is at most n by q plus one this sum and then I have this is a constant so that comes out so this is equal phi q into n by q plus one and then A mod Q, okay? So here we are, we are in good shape because phi Q is less than Q, so this is less than or equal to uh, phi Q plus N. And here to get in a nice form, I extend this sum to all residue classes, not just co prime. Since everything is positive, I can do that. So I forget this star. But this sum is nothing but sum of a n square because you know a n has to lie in one of the residue classes. So this is phi of q plus n times norm a square. So 
So that proves the theorem. And the proof works because <laughs> there is already an orthogonality that there is cancellation, a lot of cancellation taking place in this sum. And uh, the only thing that survives is sort of the diagonal. Okay, and now what is the significance of large sieve inequality? So, so the large sieve inequality says that, assuming that delta is not very large, so uh, remark. Uh, what a sharp or a good, um, a non-trivial, let's say, is that given any vector, any sequence, say a m a m plus 1, a m plus 2, up to a m plus n. The, uh, the vector uh, f1, f2, fn is almost orthogonal to this vector, so call it A to A, but on average over F. So you see, if they were really orthogonal, then this sum, this kind of sum will be zero. What Last sieve inequality says is that this sum is small on average. So the you know what is the bound for this inner product? So this is like an inner product of the vector a and vector chi, and uh, it tells you. So let's do it more uh, rigorously. So suppose I have uh, n up to n, doesn't matter, is uh, less than or equal to delta times a square. So on average, is uh, less than or equal to, so delta norm square by size of the family, so I'm taking average, so I divide by the size of the family. That is the square, and I have to take square root. <coughs> and let's say a n is also like, each a n is absolute value one. So that will give you the length of the sum. we assume and summation n f n so this will give you n so this is square root of uh, n delta by f And uh, in practice, the length and size of the family would be roughly the same, so it will be square root of delta. And square root of, and if the large sieve is sharp, size of the delta is of the size of n plus f. So it is like square root cancellation. So if then we have the bound. Uh, 
square root of delta because n by f goes. And uh, if delta is of the size n plus f, then uh, this is only on average. then we, we obtain is O of root n. That is, we get square root cancellation. So, uh, cancellation but on average over f. This is very crucial that it's on average. So, for example, uh, see the RH, GRH, implies or it's equivalent to summation mu n chi n equal to big O of n to the half plus epsilon by any epsilon. Okay, this is a well known, it's just a matter of integration. And we obtain such a bound, but on average over f, because what we got was, see if you have chi mod q, mu n chi n, we got phi q plus n, uh, times uh, norm of mu square, but that is that will give you okay, that's the what last it will give. But this is just the number of square free integers, and that's of size n. And uh, so, therefore, this is like uh, n square. So, if you take square root, you will get, I mean, if you divide by Q and then take square root, you get exactly this kind of bound. So large sieve gives so if I call this star, so LSI, so so this is theorem zero, right? So theorem zero implies star on average over uh, chi modulo q. So where uh, I'm assuming that uh, uh, n is of size uh, q, which is enough because when you have the approximate functional equation, you this length won't be too large, to be smaller than q. So, in fact, uh, smaller than Q is also fine. Okay. So, uh, that is the general philosophy that uh, large sieve that uh, large sieve inequality gives bounds that are uh, of the same strength as a Riemann hypothesis on average. So one famous example is uh, Bombay Vinogradov theorem, which we will not discuss here, but because it will take long time. But uh, what it does is, if you have the prime number theorem for arithmetic progression, you have an error term which is quite large. And Riemann hypothesis give you that error term should be small. And what bombay vinogradov theorem tells you is that if you sum over the moduli Q, then you can bound the sum of the error terms. And the bound you get is same as what Riemann hypothesis will tell you. So knowledge of Riemann hypothesis won't give you any extra help. 
And Bombay Regional Grad of Theorem basically very strongly uses uh, large sieve. The so square root cancellation means if you have a sum of some oscillatory things, so there will be cancellations, and the length of the sum is n, and assume that size of the things inside is 1. If you get a bound like square root n, then that's square root cancellation. So if you have a Bernoulli random variable, you sum them n bar independent Bernoulli random variable, you get square root n. So one way of interpreting Riemann hypothesis is that so the standard Riemann hypothesis is equivalent to saying that sum of Mobius function is like O of square root n. And that's one way of interpreting is that mu and v behaves like a Bernoulli random variable. It's very random, it's like coin tossing. Okay, so my time is up, so I'll stop. Thanks.